forward on this computer. Hello everyone, nice to see you all again. Uh, welcome uh, to the first IVA meeting this year. Hopefully you have been refreshed during the holiday and are ready for the exciting webinar. Uh, today our speaker is Cooper Salko from South California. Uh, Cooper is probably the very first undergraduate speaker in our virtual meetings. He started working on quantum uh, sensing in Takahash Group three years ago and recently got the best poster prize and the travel prize in last uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Conference. Today, he will be talking more about non Markovian spin bath dynamics of nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. Uh, Cooper's bike is yours. Feel free to start. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, my name is Cooper Selko, and uh, I'm from the University of Southern California working with Professor Susumu Takahashi. And today, I'm going to be talking about uh, non Markovian spin bath dynamics. Uh, specifically non-Markovian dynamics of single nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. So um, to start off, I just want to talk about uh, the difference between Markovian and non-Markovian models and why we need these models. So uh, in experimental quantum science, uh, we often have to perform measurements through different types of averaging. So this may include temporal, spatial, and ensemble averaging. So due to these uh, experimental measurements, done through averaging, we need to um, understand the dynamics of the system as a function of time by using uh, a statistical model. So there's two different types of st statistical models that we can use. Uh, the first is Markovian. So uh, in the Markovian, the uh, current dynamics of the system will only depend on the current state. And so therefore, in order to have a full predictive power, uh, you only need to know the current state of the system. And so it's often said that these uh, Markovian are memoryless because um, they don't require any um, memory of previous system states. And so oftentimes, these are the most commonly used models. And the reason why is because they're easy to solve and easier to understand. So. Is it just me or is Cooper gone? I think Cooper has gone. I thought it was just me. Um, I right, give it five more minutes. Yeah. Sorry about that. I think my internet went out for a second. That's all right. Okay. So, um, when exactly did it go out? Did you hear um, about the non-Markovian and Markovian models? Why don't you just repeat the, the slide again? I think that okay. would be great helpful. Okay. So, um, I'll just try to speed up the beginning part a little bit. So oftentimes when we uh, make measurements in experimental quantum experiments, uh, we go through different types of. And so in order to understand the system dynamics uh, through experimental measurements, we need to use statistical models. So there's two types of statistical models that we can use. The first is known as a Markovian model. So in the Markovian model, 
the uh, current dynamics of the system depend only on the current state of the system. So in order to have full predictive power of the future outcomes, you only need to know the current system state. So we often say that these types of models are memoryless because uh, no memory of previous system states is required in order to have full predictive power. And these types of models uh, in experimental quantum science are usually what's most commonly used because they're the uh, easiest to solve and the easiest to understand and derive. So when we have what's called an open quantum system, which is a quantum system that we're studying in an experiment coupled to some uh, environment of uh, spins, for example, then uh, we often use a master equation in order to model this open quantum system. So a master equation is just a uh, equation for the time derivative of the system density matrix as a function of time. So in the Markovian case, the time derivative of the system density matrix at time t is just proportional to the system density matrix at time. So as you can see from this equation, the dynamics, which is captured on the left-hand side, uh, only depends on the system at time t and not at any other times. So on the other hand, we also have uh, non-Markovian models. So in a non-Markovian model, the current dynamics depend on the current state and on past states as well. So in order to have full predictive power of the future outcomes, uh, you would need to have the uh, information about the full history of all previous system states, as well as the current system state. And so um, we often say that these models have memory effects. Um, these models, on the other hand, contrary to Markovia models, are not very commonly used because they're often very uh, complicated to solve. Uh, even numerically, they can sometimes be impossible to solve. And they're also uh, sometimes very hard to write down. So as you can see in this bottom equation on the right-hand side, if we have a uh, master equation, then it would be uh, the time derivative of the system density matrix at time t is proportional to uh, an integral over all uh, previous system states from time zero up to time t. So in this project and in this talk, what I'm going to be discussing is non-Markovian dynamics. So um, if we can somehow experimentally capture uh, some dynamics that are non-Markovian and therefore can't be captured by the more commonly used Markovian model, then this would have several uh, advantages, which I'll talk about here. So one of the motivations for studying non-Markovian dynamics is for improved quantum control. So if we can uh, better understand the non-Markovian dynamics, we'll have a better understanding of the dynamics of open quantum systems in general. And this can help bring uh, new perspectives for combating coherence. And um, I'll also be talking in the talk today about uh, new methods for characterizing um, these non-Markovian noise sources and uh, yeah, general methods for how to do this in an experiment. Um, another thing that's very interesting about non-Markovian dynamics is that uh, it may offer a new way to uh, generate and control entanglement between a system and a bath of many spins. So this is something that I'll get into in more detail later. So uh, first, I want to briefly cover the uh, NV center because um, that's what I'll be using in the uh, experiment that I perform. And I'll also be discussing some of the uh, spin states. So I think it's useful to briefly cover this. So the NV center has a number of special properties. Um, but what's uh, important to note here is that it's optically addressable. So this means that uh, we can apply a laser to initialize its state. And then we can also use a laser to read out its state. So uh, if the NV center, the NV center is a spin S equals one system. And so uh, if we start in the ground state and we apply a uh, green laser excitation at 532 nanometers, then um, due to this uh, decay to the metal metastable state and down to the MS equals zero ground state, we can uh, initialize the NV center into the MS equals zero uh, spin state. So then uh, if I show you in this uh, energy level diagram on the right-hand side here, when we apply a magnetic field, 
we can split the degeneracy between the MS equals uh, plus and minus one spin states. And by then uh, applying a microwave that is at the resonant frequency or equal to the frequency of the energy level difference of the spin states, then we can have the MV center act a artificial qubit. So um, I also illustrated that here in the bottom of the left-hand graph. So we first apply the laser excitation to initialize the NV center spin state into the MS equals zero. Then after this, we can then apply a microwave uh, in order to control our qubit between the MS equals zero and then either the MS equals plus or minus one spin state when we apply a magnetic field. And then finally, we can also use laser excitation to read out the spin state. The zero spin state gives off a uh, higher intensity or a brighter amount of fluorescence compared to the MS equals plus or minus one spin states. So um, by applying a short laser pulse and reading out the fluorescence that uh, decays, we can then tell, uh, based on the fluorescence intensity, what the spin state of the NV center is. So this is how we um, can use the NV center spin states in order to uh, initialize and read out and also control the uh, qubit. Um, so in the talk today, there's going to be uh, two different uh, diamond crystals or diamond samples that I'll be uh, using. So the first is uh, an NV center, which is surrounded by a bath of P1 centers. So P1 centers are substitutional nitrogens. And uh, this frees up a uh, electron. And so the P1 center acts as an S equals or spin one half uh, system. And so due to the gyromagnetic ratio of the uh, ele electron being higher, uh, we would expect in this sample to have a short T2 relaxation time and a strong coupling of the NV center to the bath. And on the other hand, I'll also be studying um, an NV center, which is coupled to a bath of carbon-13 uh, nuclei. So due to the uh, smaller gyromagnetic ratio, we would expect that the NV center has a longer T2 relaxation time and a weaker coupling to the bath. So um, now I'll a little bit more uh, in detail into the Markovian and non-Markovian uh, dynamics. So Markovian dynamics comes from static noise, which is essentially just random noise. So random fluctuations uh, from these environmental uh, blue spins will cause an exponential decay of the quantum coherence. And for a qubit, we can think of the coherence uh, being proportional to the length of the block vector on the block sphere. So for example, if we have an NV center and we can initialize its state into a superposition, um, between ms equals zero and ms equals plus or minus one, then on the block sphere, this would correspond to uh, a block vector of length one in the transverse plane. So if we had Markovian dynamics or a Markovian noise source, then we would expect the length vector and also therefore the coherence to decay exponentially. Um, on the other hand, uh, I'm Non-Markovian dynamics arises from non-stochastic noise, which essentially just means uh, noise that is not random. So typically, this arises due to slow internal evolutions in the environment that will produce some uh, somehow temporally correlated noise. And so this will correspond to oscillations in the quantum coherence rather than decay. So um, if we consider the Hamiltonian that's given by this equation here, uh, this could model something such as the NV center spin state, which is uh, coupled to a spin one half qubit. So um, in this case, if the NV center is in the MS equals zero spin state, then it has zero magnetic moment. And so it doesn't couple to the blue spin at all. However, uh, on the other hand, if the NV center spin state is in the MS equals one, uh, spin state, then it has some magnetic moment, and it will produce a magnetic field that will uh, couple to the blue spin. And so this uh, hyperfine coupling will uh, induce oscillations uh, on the blue spin. And so this blue spin will flip from uh, 
spin up to spin down uh, continuously. So uh, what we can see from this uh, model is that if we initialize the NV center into a uh, superposition state of MS equals zero and MS equals minus one, then we will start off in this product state between the green and blue spin. However, after some time, after some evolution, we will actually end up with uh, an entangled state. And the reason why this happens is because the blue spin will flip conditional on the spin state of the green spin. So if the green spin is MS equals zero, then the blue spin stays up. And if the green spin is MS equals minus one, then the blue spin will oscillate between up and down. And so as this happens, we'll see as the uh, blue spin oscillates up and down when the green spin is MS equals minus one, we'll see that the two spins together will oscillate between a product state and an entangled state. And so this will happen back and forth, going to product state and entangled state. And so this will correspond <clears throat> to oscillations in the quantum coherence. And this is a uh, non-Markovian noise. So when the block vector has a length one uh, in the transverse plane, this corresponds to the product state because in the product state, we have a coherent superposition between MS equals zero and MS equals minus one. However, when, uh, when the green and the blue spin become entangled with each other, we then have a uh, maximally mixed state. And so on the block sphere, this corresponds to a uh, block vector uh, just being a dot in the center and having no length and no coherence because we've lost the coherent superposition. And then this again oscillates back, which is shown in this third block sphere here. So this um, sort of oscillation in the quantum coherence as a function of time, and for a qubit oscillation in the length of the block vector, uh, this is the non-Markovian uh, noise. So now that we've understood non-Markovian noise from two qubits, uh, what I want to uh, study and talk about today is how we can try to understand non-Markovian noise coming from a bath of many, many spins instead of just one qubit. So in order to do that, um, I, I'm going to use the uh, post-Markovian master equation or PMME. So uh, the equation is given at the top here and we can clearly see that the time derivative for the system density matrix is an integral uh, over past system density matrices. And so that is what makes this master equation non-Markovian. Uh, it depends on all previous system states, not just the current one. And so in this equation, uh, this function k of t acts as a weighting function of previous system states. And so uh, it represents the memory of the bath because the stronger or I guess the uh, higher the value for the, uh, for the function k, the uh, more important the previous system states will uh, be on the current uh, spin bath dynamics. And so um, by using this memory kernel, we can try to uh, model different memories uh, of the bath and different influences of previous system states. So one important case to consider is that if uh, k of tau is equal to delta of tau, then uh, the integral goes away and we simply get a Markovian equation that the time derivative is equal or is proportional to the system uh, density matrix at time t. And so this operator L simply represents the uh, Lidblad equation, which is the most common uh, Markovian master equation that's used. And so in this equation, the first term is the uh, representative of the unitary dynamics. And so it's um, pretty much like the Schrodinger equation, but for density matrices. And then the second term is uh, responsible for the dissipative dynamics. So each of these V sub K operators are Lindblad operators, and they can be chosen to represent different types of dissipative bath dynamics. And then this gamma sub K uh, is the corresponding strength of each type of dissipative uh, dynamics. So in uh, my specific study, I chose to use a memory kernel, which is uh, given here. It's just an exponential uh, decaying function. And so the reason I chose this is because I thought it intuitively made sense that um, system states very far in the past would have a very little effect on the current spin bath dynamics. But 
uh, system states that are very close um, to the current time would have a larger effect. And so the influence of previous system states will exponentially decay over time. And then I also chose um, a single Lindblad operator, V sub K, uh, equal to the Pali matrix, sigma Z. And this represents uh, pure dephasing. So this is a type of uh, Markovian noise in the model. And so the corresponding rate or the corresponding strength of this uh, pure dephasing is given by gamma Z. There's a total of uh, three parameters in the model, capital A, lowercase a, and gamma Z. And so I just wanted to briefly say that this uh, equation is very important because it's analytically solvable, which is uh, not very common among non-Markovian master equations. Uh, furthermore, it doesn't require any knowledge of the bath. So uh, typically the parameters that I mentioned previously are uh, fit to experimental data. And so therefore there's no previous knowledge of the system bath interactions in order to use this equation. And then finally, just to mention, this equation is capable of capturing both Markovian and non-Markovian noise. So for any general type of experiment, we can use this uh, as a model. So um, to quickly get into some of the experimental probes of non-Markovian dynamics, the first is the using the PMME itself. So in an experiment, we could measure the uh, block vector as a function of time. And so if we see these oscillations in the length of the block vector or oscillations in the quantum coherence, <clears throat> then we can conclude that there's some type of uh, non-Markovian noise. And also fitting the experimental data to the PMME may reveal uh, the strength of the non-Markovian dynamics. So uh, as can be seen in this figure on the right here, uh, I simulated both Markovian and non-Markovian models. And uh, we see that if we initialize into the minus y state, which just corresponds to the block vector of 0 minus 1, 0, then uh, the length of the block vector uh, just exponentially decays in the Markovian case, which is shown in red here. But um, there's actually oscillations in the length of the block vector, which is shown in blue here. And so these are not just off resonance effects because it's only seen in the Y component of the block vector and not the X component as well. So these are different from off resonance effects, but are actually oscillations in the quantum coherence and the length of the block vector. Um, the other experimental probe of non-Markovian dynamics that I wanna talk about is the uh, something known as the trace norm distance measurement. So the trace norm distance measurement is given by this equation here, uh, D. And so um, essentially or intuitively, what D represents is the optimal measure of ability between two different quantum states. And so if two quantum states become more distinguishable, <clears throat> then we can conclude that we have more information about them. Uh, and this would correspond to a larger value of D. On the other hand, if D uh, were to decrease, this would mean that the two states are less distinguishable and that we therefore have less information about them. So what we can do is we can um, measure this trace norm distance as a function of time for two different initial states. And then based on uh, monitoring the trace norm distance as a function of time, if we see that it increases, then this implies that we've gained information about our system and that uh, there's therefore been some information backflow from the back to the system. Um, the only way for this information backflow to be possible is if the bat has some memory about the uh, quantum information. And so um, therefore the trace norm distance provides an interesting way to quantify the degree of non-Markovianity and measure the uh, amount of quantum information that we have of our system as a function of time. So um, yeah, I also wanted to briefly mention that uh, for two qubits, this trace norm distance D actually just corresponds to the physical distance between each of the block vectors uh, on the block sphere. So <clears throat> in order to uh, get a bit of a more intuitive understanding of the PMME and its parameters, I plotted some phase diagrams where uh, on the X and Y axes, I varied the values of some of the parameters. And then on the Z axis, I plotted, plotted the uh, maximum of the derivative of the trace norm distance D. <clears throat> so in the literature, uh, the maximum of the derivative of D is a common way to quantify the degree of non-Markovianity. 
So a higher value of uh, the z-axis corresponds to a stronger, a non-Markovian set. So we see, and then also um, capital A represents the strength of the memory effects. Uh, lowercase a represents the uh, decay rate of the memory kernel. And then gamma z represents the Markovian coherence loss. So we see that for larger values of a, um, we have a stronger non-Markovian effects, uh, which makes sense because it corresponds to the strength of the memory effects. And then for lowercase a, uh, lower values give a stronger non-Markovian effect, which also makes sense because um, uh, it means that the memory is decaying slower. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, I'll move on. <clears throat> so I just very briefly wanted to mention that uh, an experiment using the same methods has been done by uh, some of my colleagues at USC, uh, namely Hai Meng Zhang and uh, Professor Daniel Ladar. And so they did this experiment on superconducting qubits. And so uh, they were able to measure the block vector as a function of time. And then they also measured the derivative of the trace norm distance as a function of time for different value or for different states of the uh, bath spins. And so by controlling the bath spins and putting them into different initial states and monitoring this trace norm distance as a function of time, they found that uh, the derivative was positive which implied that there was an increase in D as a function of time and therefore some information backflow. But what was also interesting is that they found that for different initial states, they had different dynamics of this information backflow. So now to move on to the experiment using uh, a single NB center. So first we can um, use a uh, laser with um, a microscope objective in order to identify single NB centers. Um, then we can also perform autocorrelation measurements, which are shown here, in order to confirm that the fluorescence signal is coming from a single quantum emitter. And we can then perform optically detected magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy, um, essentially free, uh, sweeping the resonance frequency in order to uh, detect the resonance frequency of the NB center. Uh, then in figure B here, this is how we can um, <clears throat> use the fluorescence intensity. Uh, in order to map, or this is how we can uh, collect fluorescence intensity in the experiment and then map it to a block vector component. So um, this purple line shown here, which is given by the pulse sequence max, corresponds to the fluorescence of the MS equals zero state because we uh, simply initialize and then read out. The uh, fluorescence, or the green line shown here, is the fluorescence intensity of the MS equals minus one spin state because we initialize apply a pi pulse and then read out. And then finally, the blue line show he shown here is when we uh, initialize into the MS equals zero state and then apply a microwave pulse of a time tau p. And so as we sweep the length of the uh, tau p, we can uh, have some Rabi oscillations where we uh, start in the MS equals zero state and then uh, oscillate between MS equals minus one and MS equals zero state. And so we can then map this Rabi oscillations data to the block vector using the purple, blue, and uh, green lines. So by using this uh, raw fluorescence, we can then map this fluorescence to the uh, one of the block vector components as a function of time. So in this case, since the microwave applied was an X phase, we were rotating the block vector along the YZ plane, and therefore we can plot the Z component of the block vector as a function of time the Rabi oscillations. And so this is the general procedure that was used in the quantum state tomography uh, experiment that I'll be discussing. So um, yeah, in the interest of time, I'll just go very briefly over this. So um, a laser is used to initialize and read out the state. And then, um, so this is these are the pulse sequences that were used in order to measure the block vector components as a function of time. So um, the laser, initializes and read, reads out the quantum state for each pulse sequence. And then for each of the block vector components, the microwave first initializes into any uh, state on the block sphere. And then different readout pulses are applied in order to project um, that component onto the z-axis. Once this uh, x, y, or z component is projected onto the z-axis, the corresponding fluorescence is then uh, read out along the z-axis. So um, now to get into the actual experiment and the data that was collected. 
So uh, the first single NV center that was studied was in a uh, surrounded by a bath of P1 centers. And so the inherent nitrogen uh, nucleus of the NV center in this case was polarized into a single spin state. So there was no uh, hyperfine coupling and therefore the uh, resonance frequency was just a uh, single frequency or a single peak, which is shown uh, in figure A here. And so um, I, I initialized into two different initial states. So the first was minus Y and the second was plus Y. And the experimental data is shown in green. And then the simulation uh, using the post Markovian master equation is shown in purple. So you see that there's a good agreement between the <clears throat> uh, experiment and simulation. Then I also measured the uh, trace norm distance as a function of time. So again, uh, an increase in the trace norm distance as a function of time would uh, be a non-Markovian effect. So here we see that for this particular NV center in this particular system, uh, it appears that the trace norm distance D simply uh, monotonically decays as a function of time. So this would uh, imply that the spin bath dynamics are actually Markovian in this case and not non-Markovian. Uh, I then also studied a um, another single NV center in a different diamond crystal. So this NV center was surrounded by a bath of carbon-13 uh, nuclei, and the inherent nitrogen nucleus to the NV center in this case was a 15N which is a nuclear spin one half. So in this case, <clears throat> the uh, ODMR spectrum uh, has two peaks because um, due to the hyperfine splitting of the 15N nucleus. And so in the experiment, the microwave frequency was chosen to be, uh, or the resonance frequency used for the pulse sequences was chosen to be peak one. So 50% of the time, we would be on resonance and 50% of the time we would be off resonance by about three megahertz. So uh, in order to obtain the uh, purple line, which is shown in each of the graphs, I simulated uh, the PMME or the post Markovian master equation uh, being on resonance and also being three megahertz off resonance. And I then took the uh, average of these two answers. And that is what is shown in purple in each of the graphs. Then. I also uh, wanted to display the on-resonant and off-resonant uh, cases of the PMME. And so those are shown in uh, blue and orange here in the inset of each graph. So the blue line, which is peak one, corresponds to uh, this peak here. And then the orange line which corresponds to the off-resonant peak, which is here. And so um, what I wanted to do is try to analyze this um, <clears throat> as being uh, either on resonant or off resonant and try to, uh, yeah, see if I could look beyond the non-Markovian effects that are just coming from the inherent nitrogen nucleus. So we see that the purple line fits the data pretty well. However, there are actually some uh, places that don't agree. So for example, uh, at about one microsecond for the initial state plus Y, the X and Y components uh, have some spikes in the experimental data here and also here, which are not captured by the simulation. So this is still uh, an open question that I'm trying to answer with my analysis. And so if we uh, monitor the trace norm distance as a function of time, <clears throat> we see both experimentally and from the simulation that there are very clear uh, increases as a function of time. And so it means that the, uh, there is a non-Markovian effect. However, if we look at the inset, which shows the on-resonant and off-resonant components, we just see monotonic decay of the trace norm distance D. And so what this means is that there is some non-Markovian effect and some of this uh, information backflow that I was discussing earlier. However, it seems to be coming from the inherent nitrogen nuclear spin of the NV center and not from the actual bath spins. And this is because we see these uh, this increase in the trace from distance D when we look at uh, both the on-resonant and off-resonant cases together, but we don't see it when we look at them individually. And so it means that these oscillations are coming from the uh, hyperfine splitting and from the coupling 
of the uh, nitrogen nucleus to the NV center. Um, one open question uh, that we're still trying to answer is that it seems like the simulation does not fully capture uh, some of the features in the experimental data. So for example, at around one microsecond, uh, this peak here uh, is not fully captured by the simulation. And so uh, because this purple line doesn't fit the experiment, uh, these lines are also not truly representative of the experiment as well. So um, to summarize, uh, in experimental quantum science, we often perform measurements through many different types of averaging, and therefore we need statistical models to understand the spin dynamics. Uh, one of these statistical models is uh, a non-Markovian model. And so uh, in this talk, I discussed how non-Markovian dynamics can be used for a better understanding of spin physics, which can then be used to combat decoherence. And it also may serve as a way to uh, probe many body entanglement between the system and the bath. And so uh, I then also described the uh, general methods for investigating non-Markovian noise, which is to use the post-Markovian master equation uh, and to measure the block vector components as a function of time. And then also to use this trace norm distance uh, measurement between two different quantum states. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, the members of that, and then also uh, acknowledge uh, those who worked on a similar project previously conducting qubits. So that would be uh, Jaime Zhang and uh, Professor Daniel Dodd. So, uh, yeah, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming and watching. and. Uh, yeah, thank you.